what we do and say intentionally or unintentionally alters the way that the future goes. And if we don't have a longer term vision for what, what, what we want to be, I think we can make a lot of those decisions on a short term basis that don't serve the long term vision. We are one of the only species that can make a decision to be somebody different in five years and today. And I think that's a gift we, we need to take advantage of it. Welcome to the Business Builder Way podcast, where we help business builders grow leadership skills and wisdom and stay grounded through hero stories. So let's get after it. Hey, business builders. Welcome to the Business Builder Way podcast. I'm excited to have Herb Sargent with us today. For those of you on YouTube, he's waving. He's coming to us from Maine. And you may know that my wife is a Mainer also. So I've had the privilege to spend time in Herb's truck at one of the uh, pits that they own where they're crushing rock to create aggregate for their operations on the highways of Maine and beyond. And I love the time we spent together. I almost wish Herb that I'd had my camera going at that time, but this is the second best and we'll work it from there. Herb is, I just said founder, but he said, hold on, not founder. And he'll tell you more about that. Herb is currently leading Sargent, and Sargent is the largest heavy highway contractor in Maine. They also have offices in New Hampshire and Virginia and North Carolina, and they're doing their work there. I met Herb on LinkedIn. I loved his messages about leadership and about his employees and how he loves them, and that came out when I was in the truck. And I'm really excited, Herb, for you to share your story with the business builders today. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for that kind introduction. And, and you and I have threatened to get together a couple more times. As I recall, last summer, you had a, a hot yeah. water heater issue that interrupted our, our opportunity to get together. Yeah, you know, my wife's camp on a lake is very close to Herb. That's right. And the hot water heater went and my brother-in-law was there and I knew we could go into the small town and get one and get it done. So thanks for understanding. Uh, and if you would just tell us who you are and tell us about the company. Sure. So a lot of times people want to know who the founder of the company is. And that's a little bit weird with us. I would call myself a following founder versus a founder. My grandfather founded our business in 1926 and then my dad and uncle took the business over in 1975 or so. And then they sold the business to a company from Paris, France in 1988. So that company was bought by a larger company, was bought by another larger company, was bought by another larger company. In the intervening years in 1991, I left and started my own business, but then uh, circle back in 2005 and bought my grandfather's original business pack from the Europeans. So in some ways I founded this because my company is the succeeding acquirer, but in, in real ways, my grandfather founded it and really established the foundation and the legacy we work with today. And in the intervening years, when you had your own company, that was also earth moving. You were in the business still, right? Yep. What was it? What was it like to start that company, the the one you went out? Because you've had the experience of acquiring a bigger company, but you've all you've also done the right from the get go. I mean, we were we were a pretty big organization in in the late eighties when the company was sold, and you know the largest earth mover in the state at that time, and sixty plus years in history, so well established. And and basically, I was in an organization that whenever I needed anything, I could get it. Like if I needed a D8 bulldozer, I just called on the two-way radio and, and made arrangements to get a D8 bulldozer, right? Or if I needed a performance and payment bond on a project as I was a project manager, I just, at the time, faxed the request. Some of your listeners may not know what a fax is, but faxed the request to the bonding company and we got it. And then when I left to start my own business, I mean, I had nothing. I had about $30,000 401k and I walked away from a decent job, but I had nothing. So when we finally got a project, I kind of looked around and said, I don't even have a shovel. Right. right. I mean, I had one at my house, but I don't have shovels to use. So I got to go buy shovels. I've got to go buy rotating lasers. I've got to go buy pipe lasers. I've got to buy trench shields. I've got to buy, and we rented material, we rented uh, equipment at the time, but that was an eye opener for me. That it wasn't just pick up the two-way radio and say send a rack truck over with all these small tools and everything. And that was probably the easiest problem to get past. The financial 
roller coaster you go through when you start a business is especially a, a capital intensive business like a construction company. I mean, you, you think you're good. You got a bill out, right? You've got an invoice out and you expect to get paid and that's going to replenish your bank account. But all of a sudden the money doesn't come in when you thought it was going to. And I, I mean, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars here and you're out that much. So trying to, to learn how that all goes in the absence of someone who is a really astute financial controller was difficult for me. And, and a lot of lessons came from that. So you had that company that you had started. In the meantime, Sargent is being run by other people. Right. How big did that company that you started, how far did you take that before that time when you were then in the negotiating room with the Europeans? Yeah, so we were about 100 employees over 10, 12 years. We were doing 15 to $20 million in revenue. So not a very big company, really. These numbers would be much bigger today than they were 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah, so about 100 people. It's been interesting lately. I have a mentor who's 76, and I've been playing with age and number. It's natural that like, I kind of put myself on timelines, and I'm a coach, so I shouldn't be comparing myself to others. <laughs> It's natural that we're like kind of watching and thinking, and we don't know how long we have, but with that 10 years, how old were you when you were in that so zone? Right I now? started in business at 28 and we bought what was called then HE Sergeant named after my grandfather. We bought that in 2005 and I was 42 at that time. Got it. So I'm going to skip time frames a little bit, but I think it would be helpful to understand what is the business now? So we'll go back to where you, sure. you bought it and how that happened, but what does the business look like now? So now we're just short of about 500 people. And as you mentioned, we're working in Maine, New Hampshire, Virginia, and North Carolina. We also do some work in Massachusetts. We've been in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware. So we've been in a number of states. We're focused right now in Virginia and North Carolina for our Mid-Atlantic team, and then Maine and New Hampshire for our New England team. And you just opened a new office, right? Yeah, down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Yeah, it was really a, a great opportunity that we picked up a project down there. And we were trying to, to make small bets instead of betting the whole house on, on one thing. We're trying mm -hmm. to make small bets and figure out where the opportunities are and so we bid a project in Greensboro, North Carolina at the airport, and we do a lot of airport work and we got that project and it ended up being a good project. We ended up hiring quite a few people that were local to the area. And as we got a little bit better situational awareness around that part of North Carolina, the Greensboro area, we looked around and said, maybe there's an opportunity here. And we think there is. This past fall, we opened an office. We hired a guy named Chris Horn to manage that office. And so he just started with us a couple months ago and we got some work underway and we're going for it. Um, one of the more recent Jim Collins books is Great by Choice. And he describes what you just said as first fire bullets. Yeah. Then fire cannonballs. And we just actually had that same exact conversation here Monday with our strategic planning group. And this was a good example of firing the musket ball first and then coming in with a cannonball afterwards. To try to make smaller bets. And we just read another Jim Collins book called How the Mighty Fall. Mm -hmm. and I started reading that in 2018 and I had to put it down because I could see me and I could see our company on the pages of that book. And so, so I put it down. And we did our own strategic plan according to a lot of the Collins principles. And we've really improved tremendously over these recent years. So we actually had our group read that book, How the Mighty Fall. And one of the things that I saw in that was if I go back 10, 12 years, uh, I can see pretty big decisions that I made that weren't well thought out. They weren't well founded. Frankly, they were probably more ego based than anything. And one example is we bought into the ready mix business, thinking it was similar enough to Earthwork that we ought to be able to, you know, if we can win at Earthwork, we can win at ready mix, right? We never won at ready mix. It took us 10 years to finally stop throwing good money after bad hmm. and just say, okay, it's time to end this. So that's an example of 
some of the things that in that book, how the mighty fall was like, you make decisions that aren't really that good. And they're cannonballs versus saving the cannonballs and using the musket balls to engage the line of sight. So I heard two things there that were interesting. One is you said our strategic planning group. So interesting, uh, but once upon a time, you were the strategic planning group, right? Correct. But now the company has gotten to this place where you're not everything and you have a strategic planning group. And and so that's when, yeah. when I develop. For you. I, I guess, you know, maybe my job is to work myself out of a job in a way, but I've got a lot of experience. Most of my experience is construction experience, not necessarily running a business this size experience. Frankly, in, in a lot of ways, this business has outgrown me. And so I can't possibly think of everything that needs to be thought of, right? Mm -hmm. And if I did, 50% of it would be wrong anyway. So we've got a group of about, I think it's about eight people that we meet monthly to just check in, but quarterly to make a plan. And interim planning is intended to lead us toward our 20-year vision, which we established in 2021. So we've got that as kind of the guiding North Star. And so everything we do now is in service of that. Got it. And, and the other thing you said, and I think people listening that are building businesses, it's not that we're, none of us are going to be hurt, right? We're going to talk about future path and, and thing. And yeah. there's something you want to share. None of us are Herb. I should be Wayne. However, I think it's good to learn from people that clearly have had successes and who are willing to say, I went through a period of time where maybe my ego got in the way I made bad decisions. Those are the kind of people that I want to learn from. And so one of the things I heard you say that would be useful for people is you were reading the book, How the Mighty Fall, and you realized that we were on the pages and you use this phrase, I put the book down. I, what I gather was I, like, I put the book down and I got to work because I felt like there were things in there that were hitting close to home and I need to do something about yeah. it. Is that close? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we were involved in, in a strategic planning group at that time. And so we kind of have two groups just really quickly. A larger group sets like a 10 or 20 year plan and then the smaller group implements it. So I call it the strategic plan imp implementation group. So we were in this 28th session and we were reading all these Collins books and I happened to pick this one up and I just started, I got maybe 50 pages into it. And I was like, man, to be honest with you, we weren't a strong company at that time. Everybody could still stand to be stronger, right? We still mm -hmm. have weaknesses and blind spots, sure. but financially we weren't a great company at that time. I think we had a lot of great ideas. We just weren't putting them in place well. And some of the decisions that I mentioned, they were maybe ego-driven and not well thrashed out. And so that's when I said, I got to put this thing down because I'm really afraid for us. So I put it down and focused on building instead of, you know, focused on good to great and that sort of thing. And it's worked out well for us, but I still thought it's a pretty easy read. Mm -hmm. Thought it was worthwhile for our group to read just so that I could go, and this is what I did with it this past Monday, is I talked to our group about what I have seen in the last 10 years, the things I've just discussed with you, because a lot of our people in that group have only been here two or three years. Mm -hmm. So they're not familiar with that. And my point is, let's just not relive that. Let's not make the same mistakes twice or three, three times. Interestingly, you just sparked a memory for me. My dad started a company in 1992. I went off and did my own thing. Actually, kind of in your industry, I was in the drilling and blasting industry when I got out of school because I wasn't going to work with a family business. But then in 2004, I went back and worked with my dad and he had gone through kind of some difficult times throughout the years. And I can remember him doing what you just described. Like I hadn't been there, but he was able to yeah. you know, share with me uh, what it was like, what happened, what preceded that, what it but both externally and then also like internally places where he had gotten a little bit complacent or fat and happy. And he would say, watch out for this. And of course, then there's father son dynamics. And I didn't always listen, quite frankly, but he was able to do a lot of that. So it makes sense that you would do yeah. that for your team. So go, going back a little bit farther and think about you, the person, you, the business builder who now reads books and then relays that to people. Some of this did start earlier in your story with your grandfather, right? Yeah. And part of who you are as a human and a leader 
so, some of that go, goes all the way back to to being young. So what, what was he like? And uh, maybe honor him a little bit. That, yeah, so he lived to be 100 years old. I, I was 43 years old when he passed away. So unlike a lot of folks with their grandparents, I got to spend a lot of time with my grandfather. And he loved the business and he loved to be in the vehicle. So if I was going to visit jobs, I'd take him with me and we'd just talk about so much. You know, I mean, he could be very surficial in the way he spoke. But I think he laid it out there to let it sink in. He didn't want to drive these notions into you. He wanted to kind of lay them out there and let them sink in. And so there's so much wisdom that he had around people and business. And in fact, one of the most profound things that he said to me when I told him that we were considering buying his company is, listen, if this works on the business merits, do it but don't do it on the emotional merits because you'll make a big mistake. For a guy that I'm sure would be glad to see his company come back into family ownership, you know, that meant a lot. And for him to have that dissociation with the emotional aspect of it himself, I mean, he put that on display. He just was so tuned into people, so tuned into community and family. He had a way about him that just made everybody grateful to be around it. And me included. And when you did buy it, when you went through that decision process that he weighed in and gave you that, that gift to say, hey, don't do this yeah. on my account. I remember you telling me about that a bit in the truck that day. So what was that like making this big decision? And my recollection is you did have to borrow a lot of money and you were on the line. And I think one of the things I recall is you saying you already had a vision of how you pretty quickly would be able to turn it into employee-owned company, or maybe that came later, but what was going yeah. on at that time? Yeah, so th this was a company that was about five, six times our size. And as a business that was about 10, 12 years old, I had not built up a, a huge financial war chest. Uh, I was always investing back in the business with equipment, that sort of thing. So I had to borrow a lot, a lot of money. And if there's any analogy to saying I'm all in, that's what this was. My house was on the line. My cars were on the line. All my bank accounts were on the line. Everything was on the line. Everything I owned personally. And you've seen that yourself. That's one way to motivate yourself to make sure you get it right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had two great uh, guys that were working with me at the time, Tim Folster and George Thomas, and we said, if we do this, we've only got one chance to get it right. Because if, if we buy this company, we get it wrong, we're all out of a job, me included. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get this right. So we put together what I felt was a really effective plan to be visible to them. As Tim used to say, construction workers really want two things, good equipment and backlog. They want to know they've got a job to go to and they want sure. to do it with. So we literally flushed out the fleet and put new equipment on them. We rented a lot of stuff. Part of the way we financed the, the purchase of the business was to sell the equipment. And then we went into to almost 100% rentals, but the crew loved it because they had new equipment. So right. between the visibility and the new equipment and our approach to backlog, uh, we gained pretty good credibility. Important also to note that all three of us had worked in the business it, that we were buying before. So everyone knew us there as well. At that same time, you mentioned ESOP, employee ownership. Before we even closed on the business, I call myself the familial concept in this business because I've got two wonderful children, either side of 30 years old, but they have dreams that are totally outside construction that I respect greatly. So I knew that I wasn't going to have family come in. What was that word you said? The what? Familial cul-de-sac. So in other words... It, it, in, in terms of the family aspect of this business, it's ending with me. Yep. So the question was, okay, we're going to make this big purchase, but then what do we do with it in the future? So the question was in my mind, what am I going to do with it? Because I'm not going to live forever, right? And I want this company to survive beyond me. So I went on a search and seizure mission, mission about two years afterwards and studied ESOPs. It was almost six, seven years before we finally pulled the trigger and, and became 100% employee-owned in 2000. So that gives us insight into who you are and how you've done this to that whole piece there, like thinking about the future and what's going to happen. I'm not going to do it forever. The search and seizure mission, I don't understand this, but I'm going to go find out whatever I need to find out to be able to do it. 
And that's definitely kind of the entrepreneur way you've done that. on. Well, I can say that I, I could have learned a lot more about him too. If you took a, a classroom of 30 kids and said, here's some Play-Doh, make me a snowman, that'd all be shaped differently, right? right? And ESOPs can be the same way. They're highly regulated by the government. So to get it right is important. And I wish I'd known more when, before we did it. We've had to change some things. Not that, that nothing was illegal, but just not ideal. And we probably will always will change things, I think, in terms of the way the, the ESOP is structured. Not in a dramatic way, but we've got to tweak things here and there to make sure that the promise of ESOP, the promise of the eventual payday for employees is there. Yeah. So you just said... People want, in your industry, people want good equipment and backlog, but I also heard and felt you talk about employee ownership and, and ESOP when I was with you, and I've observed you talking about culture and people in the story, so people in today's world may want even, they might still want good equipment and backlog, but they're wanting opportunity and they're wanting belonging and connection, and you and your team, I know it's not only you now, you've yeah. got voices, continue to work to stay relevant for those best workers or the people that have the best potential out there. But when I was with you, what you were was powerful to me. You pointed out people that were working there at the pit on equipment, and you had an idea of roughly what their ownership in the company was. And you were clearly proud of that and felt good about that. And at the same time, you told me a story about rolling out ESOP and not like over promising good you're smiling yeah. so you told me about almost a town hall meeting where you gather yeah. people. would you share a little bit about yeah that? so when we became an ease for a lot of people ownership is a thing to, to get a grasp of right just owning mm -hmm. a business so to, an ESOP is difficult because you know you say to a guy okay well, you're the owner and he looks down the line he says well there's 200 other people here Who's in charge? Well, so I was very clear to point out that ownership didn't mean at the time 400 presidents. We're still mm -hmm. going to manage the business the same way we always did. You know, I'm in charge. We've got other people that are in charge as well. And that's the way it's going to stay. The other thing is I want to be clear about set the expectation on when they got their first statement, what it was going to look like. And also set the expectation for what it might eventually look like. So uh, my point was, this is not your retirement. I still need you to, to focus on your 401k for retirement. Don't count on social security. Focus on your 401k for retirement. And, and we still match. Most ESOPs cease their matching when they become ESOPs. We still do match. And so I want you to focus on that and, and think of this like it's going to be your bass boat or your fifth wheel camper, right? Something like that. It's going to be something to augment your enjoyment of retirement. It's not going to be your retirement. Also, if everything goes well this year, this is back in 2013, if everything goes well this year perfectly, your average individual value of all you in this room is going to be $147. So I, I want to make sure they knew what it meant. So it, the easiest way I can say it is this, it's like if you've got 10 people and you own an apartment complex that's worth, let's say, a million dollars, and you say, okay, we're going to make a, a, an ESOP out of this, I'm going to sell you for a million dollars on day one they have no equity so what they can do to build equity is either add more apartments or they can improve the apartments they have raise the rent they can make business better they can reduce costs right they can do things to begin to pay off that debt and increase the value of the of the apartment building also so in day one i said here's the company and i took a 100 percent promissory note for the whole value of the company back. So mm -hmm. they owed me all that. Very little in the way of equity on day one. So I get this kind of feeling of you as a leader who is telling it like it is, but also helping people see how the future could be. And I think in coaching, the work that I get to do is inviting more people to see how they can live intentionally, but it'll take work. So in that sense, you're very much like a coach and helping people see this brighter future, but understanding that they have to do the doable and take steps every day to keep making progress. Yeah, I'll tell you, we have a, we have a mutual friend, Michael Bowman, and I was on a call with him three or four years ago. 
and he used the word intentionality. And that's never a word that I've used much. It's interesting that I, I got to be almost 60 years old and intentionality, even though maybe it was a part of my life, it's not anything that I used as a concept greatly. And, and that's one of the things that, that I'm trying to introduce into my own life more. I can't ask anybody else to do it if I don't do it. So I'm trying to introduce it into my own life more, but also introduce it as a means of achieving someone's personal vision, if they even know they have it, the personal vision. And so that's another, is talking about people's personal visions. What is your personal vision? I'm talking about employees now, mostly. And there's an idea, it's kind of abstract, the future is, right? We all got one. We think if we talk about the future, the future. And I remember, I think it was Brene Brown. I, I was listening to a podcast one time and she said, we got to think about this. Like we've got an infinite number of futures. What we do in saying intentionally or unintentionally alters the way that, that future goes. And if we don't have a longer term vision for what, what, what we want to be, I think we can make a lot of those decisions on a short term basis that don't serve the long term vision. And that, that's where I'm trying to, to get with our folks is you can have a long term vision. And if it doesn't include working here at Sargent, it doesn't. That's, that happens. But I mean, God made us one of the only species that can make a decision to be somebody different in five years than we are today. That's that's rare among all the species. It's like very unique to humans. And I think that's a gift. We, we need to take advantage of that. Yeah. So as, as you were speaking about, you, you hadn't used the word intentionality, the phrase, I'll probably misquote it, but it's something like preach constantly and sometimes use words. So, and, and so I would say that was what you were doing, right? Like yeah. It's not so much work, but you mentioned Michael and I'm glad he came up. His book, Lead from the Middle, uh, has been very impactful for me. It was very powerful. And I know that he's been doing uh, work with you and your team and yeah. his concept about creating a, a, what is it? Not personal about his lead, the legend, but he, he wants your right impact to be greater. And it, it's all about intentionality. That's his right. Story. Yeah, it's, how does that go? Let your legend, legacy, I can't remember how he says it, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to butcher it, and he's going to give both of us heck, but that'll be okay, because then he can go clean it up. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, like, you're on a path where you're thinking there is going to be a transition, you're not going to be there forever, and you've been working on that living intentionally or intentionality, and how do you get the next kind of generation of leaders to carry that? flag that must be something that you're working on right now having michael come and teach his workshops to your leaders yeah. is, is probably part of that well one thing i mean i have to say i run this company with tasha gardner our cfo and eric ritchie our coo and of course they have great people that, that report to them as well and uh, they probably drive me toward intentionality more than I do myself. I mean, they're they're so in awesome. tune with planning and intentionally being somewhere. Uh, you know, I don't want to speak for them. For me, I would say unintentionality is the mother of apology. In other words, we just do things without intention. We end up in places where we sometimes wish we weren't, or we're not in the optimal place that we could have been. So these two. And the other folks that are here really help drive it. It's not like I'm having to whip people into intentionality. We're all pulling on the same yoke. We're going to work to to kind of land the plane here. And it's been great what you've been sharing. But before we started, you were telling me about this piece about developing. You, you said, I, I wish perhaps I had seen earlier how I could work on developing my own vision and how I'd like to help other people develop theirs. And so I'd like to explore that a little bit. Some of the business builders in my community, to give you an example her, because maybe you could talk to them in a sense, the way you might've talked to yourself. I have a guy, it's common that they're around age 40 and they've got what I would call like main street businesses, normal businesses, but who can make a really big impact in the life. I mean, really excavating is kind of a normal business, right? Mm -hmm. For earth moving. Right. So they're landscapers, a funeral homeowner, somebody who sells branded merchandise mm -hmm. uh, to add value. And often they have children at home, of course, who are maybe 10 to 14 years old and They've got a team of five to 20 employees and 
there they are, you know, 40, 38, 40, 42 in that range. So what is, what is it that you would share with them as you're working on this concept? And it's a critical place to be because that's the age when, for most people, their kids are, depends when middle school or coming out of high school, that sort of thing. And so they've, they've already got transitions like coming at them fast. And one of the things I wish I had done is sat down and said, okay, where do I want to be? What do I want my life to look like? How do I want to impact others? What defines me in five years? What defines me in 10 years? And this is something that I've really, at a guy that just turned 60 this past year, I've really begun to kind of pull the threads on myself. So I've got a transition coming up and sometime in the next few years. So what do I want to look like after that? What does my life want to be? I don't want to stop being impactful if, if I can be. And so I would just encourage those folks to take the time to seek out some knowledge on what a personal vision ought to look like. And it's really just going from here to there, right? It's here I am. And my personal vision is I want to be there and I'll be right open. I mean, I always like to drink a lot of beer, Wayne. I really did. And after work, I'd have a few beers. And that's just the way it was when I was out in the trenches. It just, that's the way it was. And that carried through my life. And I've done a couple of things in the last year or two that I've said, I'm going to, I'm going to offload some of these things hmm. and see what I miss. You know, so you've heard of 75 hard. Mm -hmm. so I yeah. do 75 her. It's my own rules. I get to play it. So, yeah. and I've done that the last two years and it's really helped me, you know, to, wow, I didn't drink three beers every night the last 75 days and I don't miss it. So I think some of that's just curiosity around yourself mm -hmm. and curiosity around why you meet some challenges and why you don't. But I think the intentionality towards some vision. And when I say vision, I don't mean some grandiose thing that I've got to be a king or a queen. It's, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better community member. I want to be a better mentor for the people. I want to be in better shape. I want my health. I don't want my health to uh, erode to the point where I'm heavy on everybody around me, right? So those are the kind of things to me. For me, you know, I want to be closer to God and I want him to inform the things that I do and say. So I've got to do work to get to that place in five years, 10 years, two years, whatever you said. But it's, it's like our strategic plan uh, as a business. We set a vision for 2041. We've got a bunch of things that describe it in pretty good detail. And we've got the big, hairy, audacious goal. And so we track that. We have a graph. We track that. Boom, boom, boom. And, and so what we do now in our quarterly meetings is we just make sure we're doing the things that that meet that vision out there and it's the same thing for an individual what is your big hairy audacious goal for being closer to god do you have a graph for that are you tracking that? i don't have a graph for that that's one of those things that if we ever think we're going to stop getting closer to god then we already have so for me it's taking more time like in the last year or so i've started taking one hour every morning. And the first thing I do is read the Bible and I have some prayer and then I have some time to, I don't call it meditation, but it's probably what it is. Some time to just think things through. And so I take an hour of that every morning. And I think that helps me. I'm amazed sometimes. I took a ride up to the lake about a month and a half ago. And there's something that was really heavy on me. And I literally walked over to the passenger door of the truck and I opened it and I said, God, climb in. And I closed the door and I had about a 40 minute drive and there were some things that I just wanted to flesh out. And, you know, for me, making his presence more real, I think really helped me to come to some conclusions that I might not have otherwise come to. It's a great visual. Thanks for sharing that. And so we've got 75 herb, we call it herbitation. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. Your man. All right. It, it, it's been great to get to know you better. I, I think, you know, that you're like a little bit of a micro celebrity is what they would call it <laughs> currently. 
on LinkedIn, yeah, it happens, right? You keep sharing good stuff and being vulnerable and open about what you're doing. That's what happens. So if you were to just to close this out, anything you can think of is so open-ended, but you probably think of something. If there's anything that you could share with people who would see a link to this on LinkedIn, which could be business owners, like the people that I have the privilege to work with. And it could be foremen or people that are thinking about getting into leadership. But when you think about those people on LinkedIn that see your stuff and hit the like button, what, any any closing advice or things you'd like to share with them? You now, there's a quote that I saw a while back by a guy named Peter Stropel. That's the only way I know this guy's name is this quote was attributed to him. And it said, your legacy is not what you leave for people. It's what you leave in people. And that's in the way I've tried to be in my life and in business and at home with my family. If I could be like my grandfather in this way, I'm going to just throw this out there, whether it's at work or at home. And really the realization that every single one of us is a leader. It just depends on which direction we're leading. If someone else's trajectory is impacted by something you do, you're a leader. That's just a plain fact. You're a leader. And there aren't many scenarios out there in sports or, or business that we aren't having some kind of an impact on other people on our team. Yeah, for sure. We'll wrap it up with that. Herb, thank you for, for showing up and you, sharing Wayne. your story and those thoughts and how you are and how you're approaching your work in the world. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for tuning into the Business Builder Way podcast. If this episode spoke to you, click that subscribe button and share it with a friend. That's how this message gets out into the world. If it is helpful for us to have a short conversation, I'd love to do that. Send me an email at wayne at businessbuildercamp.com.